Hey guys, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. I hope you're doing well. And um, I've got a topic I want to talk about. It's actually, this is like a, um, a prequel or a precursor to a, a video or perhaps even a series of videos that I'm intending to do in due course. Um, so uh, last week I was actually on holiday. You guys wouldn't have known because I was releasing videos anyway that I'd pre-filmed. Um, but I was on holiday up in Norfolk um, and I have to say, uh, lovely. I loved it um, up there. And um, I visited my very good friend, Paul B. Paul Bins, the sword maker, who has made various things for me, including my famous falchion, which I've uh, shown in some videos, and he's made a sort of Anglo-Saxon style sword, um, and um, various other things, a sax and spearheads and various other things I've got. Uh, Paul Bins, incidentally, shout out to him, somewhat of a legend. Uh, he was most famous um, for making uh, probably blunt reenactment swords, um, say a decade and more ago. But in recent years, he's really started making um, really top quality sharps as well. He's famous pretty much for pattern welding and he's famous for kind of what we might call migration era or Viking era, um, which are not the same necessarily, but that kind of dark age kind of period um, stuff. But he does make later stuff as well. Um, but um, really, so I was visiting him uh, partly because I was in the area and um, he, he's a good mate, uh, but also he is making something for me at the moment. So he had made a blade um, which he brought to Skirmish, Fight Camp Skirmish, which is kind of Fight Camp's smaller cousin or something, uh, which is held down here in the southeast, whereas Fight Camp's held up in the Midlands. And um, he came to Skirmish back in, what was it, April, I think, and he brought various things with him that he was working on, including several blades. Um, and I committed to buying one of the blades because I just fell in love with it. Uh, my friend Gavin bought one of the other blades he had. But essentially, the blade was almost like a blank canvas in that it hadn't been hilted yet. I just loved the blade. Now, the blade was essentially a Type 10 blade, a bit like this Albion Clontarf here, um, but bigger. Okay, so most of these Type 10 blades are um, usually about 30 inch blades, something like that. It's actually relatively rare to find Viking period or Anglo-Saxon Frankish period swords which have blades more than about 30, 31 inches. In fact, a lot of them are shorter than that. A lot of them are only about 26, 27, 28 inches. Um, but you can do the centimeter conversion. Um, but uh, you do occasionally find longer blades. In fact, you do find Viking era swords with type 10 blades as much as 34 don't think 35 but maybe 34 inches kind of at maximum and this is one of these really big blades and he'd obviously made it with the intention of marrying it to a viking era hilt um, however i have a couple of viking period swords this being one the anglo-saxon sword being another one it's over there in the corner um, and i wanted something a bit different and also i'm quite intrigued by the change over of swords, the change in design of swords around the time, and I realise this is very Anglo-centric of me and very um, kind of British history centric, um, but around the time of the Battle of Hastings. So we're talking about the 11th century. And in fact, that's a little bit too precise. It actually goes back earlier than that. So if we go back to the 10th century, so this is a what most people would um, class as a 9th century style hilt with a short guard, very, very short guard, almost not a guard at all, really, because it doesn't really protect the hand as such. It's more, I think, just to keep the hand secure. And this undoubtedly, I would say, is a development of earlier Germanic um, swords and to some degree the Roman Spartha. Although I have to say, as I've said this in previous videos, I think the relationship between the uh, sort of migration era swords, so the precursor to this, and the Roman Spartha is sometimes overstated. If we actually look at the blade types of Roman Spartha, um, then they're usually uh, mid-ribbed, uh, sort of flattened diamond section. So they've got quite different blades. Not to say that they all are. You do find Roman Spartha, which have one or multiple fillers, uh, more like a migration era sword. And equally, some migration era swords don't have a central filler. They have no filler at all. Some of them are kind of what we'd describe as lozenge section. Um, so they're, but they're quite different. And I would argue that the hilt construction and the blade form of early migration era swords, um, sort of Sutton Hoo and before that as well. So if we look at the early migration era Frankish and Anglo-Saxon swords from Graves, 
that they're really quite distinct and different from late Roman Sparta. So I would say there's a difference there. And actually what we're looking at is a, almost a continual development that was perhaps slightly influenced or perhaps heavily influenced, but influenced in some way by the Roman swords, by the Roman Sparta. But um, I think that what we're actually seeing is a, is a continual development from the Iron Age into Germanic um, swords, Germanic and Celtic, I suppose you could say, swords, um, from the pre-Roman period through the Roman period and into the post-Roman period. Because you have to remember, of course, that there were, um, there were areas of Europe which were kind of outside the Roman sphere and that maintained their own um, cultural identities, their own languages and um, their own designs of weapons. Okay, And if we look at, for example, in Denmark, the Needham uh, bog finds, we can find swords that are sort of related to Roman Sparta but are different as well. And I think that's where we need to look if we're looking at the development of the Migration Era sword, which became essentially, in the end, the Viking Era sword and so on and so forth. So coming back to this, um, so what I'm particularly interested in is in the 10th and 11th century, <laughs> I said what I'm, I'm, me I'm interested in many things as anyone who watches this channel will know, but what I'm, uh, for the purposes of this, this video and the future videos I'm planning, particularly interested in is the fact that in the, let's say, end of the 10th century and into the 11th century, there was a shift in the design of hilts and it has to be said in blades as well. Now I'm only going to touch on the blades briefly, okay, um, but the general trend is for these blades to go from being relatively parallel edged to being slightly tapered and more pointy. So I did make a video, if you haven't seen it, look it up, asking why aren't Viking era swords more pointy? Because you have to think, if people are wearing armour in this era, what armour are they going to be wearing? It's going to be mail or chainmail, as it's commonly known. Okay, so if someone's wearing chainmail, cutting against it is not the most effective thing to do. If you're actually going to attack the armour and try and get through the armour, the best thing to use is a point. And that's exactly why swords like this were developed to get between plate armour, but also to get through mail armour and get through padded armour. So one of the questions is in the so-called Dark Ages, why were cutting slashing swords so popular when the predominant armour was male and the best way to get through male is with a point? It's a good question. Um, what I previously concluded in my video was there's two things. Number one, most people are using spears anyway. So spears are relatively good at getting through mail when they're stabbing. Um, but um, secondly, the fact that when you're using a sword will be in a melee when everything's gone to pot and you're just going crazy. And in that situation, when you can't use the spear anymore, you might want a slashing weapon. And thirdly, the fact that I think we sometimes overestimate, I know some people disagree with me on this, but I think we sometimes overestimate how many people in the so-called Dark Ages had access to male shirts. Now, some people did throw up quite correctly so that in the um, assizes of arms and essentially the requirement for soldiers to serve in the military, whether it be in England or France, um, under Charlemagne or Alfred the Great or whoever, um, you did have to provide a male shirt. So there is some evidence to suggest that actually maybe everybody who was serving in the military did have a male shirt and a helmet. Um, but the other thing to remember is that that's just a male shirt. So their arms, their legs, their heads, their faces, well, not the head, top of the head, but the faces and the necks are still exposed and a chopping weapon still used from those. But coming back to the point, um, narrow tapered blades, more pointy came in. But the thing that I'm really interested in is the lengthening of the cross guard. Okay, now pommels did change shape, but I'm not going to focus on that for the purposes of this video. I'll talk more about that in a future video. I know that's my favourite saying. But uh, longer cross guards. So we have to wonder why did cross guards get longer in um, um, sometimes curved and sometimes straight. Okay, so from quite early on, even pre 1000 AD. So even if we're looking at the late 900s, we start to see in art and archeology, span so surviving swords, we start to see the lengthening of the guard, both straight examples and curved examples. There's quite a famous, quite curved example that's quite early. Um, but most of them, it has to be said, were straight. Okay, so why does the guard get longer at that time. Now we could say, generally speaking, why does the guard get longer? 
because it protects the hand better. Okay, there's no question about that. If we um, allow this, the guard to get longer, not only does it protect the hand more from accidental uh, glances off the blade or missing the blade entirely and coming down and hitting the hand that way, the longer that guard sticks out by geometry, the more protection it offers to the hand. But also in terms of striking something, if we're fighting in um, a shield wall, for example, and my fist, which bear in mind, we've got very little evidence of these people ever wearing gloves, and certainly they, as far as we can tell, they didn't have anything like a gauntlet of any kind, even a male gauntlet, no evidence for it. Okay, so they were, they were going either with bare hands or maybe leather gloves at best. Um, and if your hand smashes into the shield boss or the shield surface or shield edge or even the helmet of an opponent, it's possibly going to break your fingers, it's going to mash your hand up. Now these were hard people. These were people not wearing very much protection. Pretty much their shield was their main protection and a helmet second and a mail shirt if they were um, lucky and if they were fully equipped for that period. But the hand smashing into a shield is going to be bad. So the longer the guard is, the more it prevents that from happening. So not just weapon strikes to the hand, even things like spear thrusts as well, in terms of deflecting, if you're deflecting something off, you're less likely to catch the spear in the hand. Even it protects the forearm more as well, because if you imagine the cross guard is sticking out here, it now protects that line to the wrist, um, and if it's on this side, it protects the line to the outside of the forearm here. So in every single way, really, that we can think of, with very obviously we could say there are more protective guards there are basket hilts you know there are saber hilts but um with very little additional technology or effort or thought just by making that guard longer you massively increase the protection to the hand okay so the question is why was given that was such a simple thing and we do see slightly longer guards in early periods you know if you go back all the way back to the xiphos for example if we go back to ancient world swords we sometimes see longer guards if we look at something like the coppice or the falcata we sometimes even see knuckle bows so people had invented more protective hand guards previously now i have always said in my videos the reason you might not need a more protective guard is because of shields okay and that's definitely true in the viking era in the viking era and in the classical era shields are so omnipresent they are just everywhere they dictate the entire type of warfare whether we're looking at romans or whether we're looking at anglo-saxons they base their warfare around shield formation shield walls okay um so if you've got shields and quite large shields everywhere you generally speaking don't need a lot of hand protection in your sword that's true so why is it that in the late 10th and 11th century they decided to start making the cross guards longer and longer some people might point out cavalry okay so when we're looking at the norman kite shield one of the common things that people say is oh well, the normans were famous cavalrymen so that's why they had this special style of shield i've never really bought that argument because we can see the long kite shield being used by Anglo-Saxons on foot. We know it was used in Scandinavia on foot. Um, and actually, if you if you try that, I mean, I have one of those shields if you've seen in my previous videos. Um, I find that it's an incredibly practical um, infantry shield. Okay, it's in terms of the protection it offers. It's not completely different to a Roman era shield, although it's held on the arm in a completely different way. Obviously. Roman shield held with the fist, um, Norman shield strapped, and obviously a different shape. But nevertheless, they protect everything from your face down to the middle of your legs or your knees at least. Okay, so, um, and that dictates a lot of the fight. If you're using a boss held Viking type shield or Anglo-Saxon or Frankish type shield, then your legs are more vulnerable, um, quite simply. You can protect them with angulation and by holding the shield out and slipping, moving the legs like you do with sword and buckler, but nevertheless, the legs are more vulnerable to, to strikes potentially. And we do see lots of leg wounds if we look at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, um, skeletons, for example, from 1066, we see they have a lot of leg wounds. Um, so. I'm not going to draw any conclusions in this video, okay? This is more to get you thinking about the topic and maybe share your ideas with me. Why does the Norman era, shall we say, and um, once the Normans, you know, late 10th and into the 11th century, the Norman era sword, why does the guard get longer and longer 
at the same time as other things going on? Is it related to the change in the types of shields being used? Is it related to the different changes in the types of armor being used? Some other kind of thing? Um, perhaps they were using the sword in a different way. Perhaps they were using the sword more to defend with than they had previously. Um, uh, your ideas are very, very welcome. I, I have my own ideas, but I don't want to necessarily um, sort of splurge those on the screen right now. I'm going to save those back, do a little bit more thinking. But to say that, um, Paul Bins is mounting this blade. Um, so it's a Type 10, but with a more tapered point. He's mounting it on a um, early Brazil nut Norman sort of 1066 era sword hilt for me. I should be getting that hopefully at fight camp, which is in the middle of August. So a month from now. And um, around that time, I will be starting to, I'll introduce the sword to you and I'll do a few more videos um, talking about Norman era weapons and my ideas about why they were designed, why those swords were changing at the time they were. One final thing before I go on to mention, um, I read an article a couple of years ago now, I think it was, about a grave in Finland and the newspaper article was based around the fact that there were two swords in the grave from wildly different periods and the funny thing was, was that actually I'm not certain that those swords were from different periods. What I mean is that these swords were still in use in the 11th century okay so what you think of as a viking era sword with a short guard and these types of lobed pommels were still being used in the 11th century at the same time as the newer more what we think of as later medieval style swords with brazil nut pommels or wheel pommels early wheel pommels and longer cross guards were in use so in the 11th century you could almost see two distinct kind of groupings of swords, the old style swords and the new style swords with the longer guards and the more tapered pointy blades. Why do you think that would be? Why do you think there were two styles of sword and why do you think there was a new style of sword coming in in the 11th century? I think it's a really interesting question and one that I haven't really seen addressed much either in videos or in books. Anyway, um, thoughts below and I hope you've enjoyed the video. I will see you for the next one. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, t-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.